Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Today, we'll talk about our open source offering, uh, how basically the tools and components and infrastructure that Netflix open source may help your business to scale and accelerate your services. First, a very brief introduction. Why you may be here? Well, because you're suffering from really terrible headaches of success. You may be in a situation where you have more developers, you have more customers, you need higher availability, you need that global footprint deployment, and yet you have no time. Terrible headaches to have. Uh, in addition, your architecture may look like this. Your standard three-tier architecture where you have your front end, some kind of UI, you have your middle tier services, and then you have your uh, RDBMS database. And you may be either in single AWS zone or even worse, you may be in your own data center. What it needs to be, if you really want high availability, if you want those globally distributed services, you have to be globally distributed, uh, deployed. Uh, and so that one such picture where you deployed multiple AWS regions, in, uh, inside each region your services are striped across multiple it, uh, uh, availability zones, and inside each zone, you may also have a picture like this where you have tons of various microservices all talking to each other, and some of them are stateless services. Some of them could be your stateful tier, whether it's Cassandra, whether it's Cache, etc. So the good news, Netflix open source components can help you get there. Uh, it's all licensed under Apache V2 license, so free to use. Uh, and uh, modify as you see fit, and it's all available at our open source site at netless.github.com. Besides open sourcing software, our main business is actually allowing people to stream movies and TV shows. We have over 50 million satisfied customers in over 50 countries now, uh, and that's growing. And what I do there is I work with various platform engineering teams. We make the most common building blocks that the rest of the engineering uses to write and deploy their applications. Uh, and also because we started open sourcing a lot of it in about two and a half years ago, I lead our open source program. And that's my Twitter handle there. So what is this Netflix open source stuff? Well, it's actually a whole bunch of components straddling many categories. It could be your database stateful tier, it could be the security, it could be big data platform, it could be availability tools and infrastructure, it could be just core infrastructure, libraries and services. It's a lot. Last I counted, we had 48 various components and it just keeps coming. We open sourced three new ones in the last two weeks and we're not about to stop. So just to set expectations, I will not even attempt to cover them all in this talk. Just not enough time. What I'm gonna do instead of that, I will identify the fundamental first principles upon, a, uh, upon which we built our platform. I'll cover some of the very core infrastructure library services and tools that are fundamental, that everything else resides on. I'll cover some of the availability best practices and patterns. Some of this may be just patterns, not even codification of that. And last but not least, I'll cover the security components because security is a big part or should be of your global deployment. At the end of the presentation, just to get you out of the mid-afternoon coma, I'll attempt to do a real a live demo. Let's see how that goes. And hopefully at the end, you'll see how you can get up and running with Netflix open source stack probably in under 10 minutes or less. So what are these core components that I'm talking about? We'll see this picture a little bit later in the presentation, but effectively what it looks like, the, the core key, key phrases, if you will. One is a microservices implementation. That means you have many services all talking to each other. Uh, two, you have what we call a Eureka, which is the service registry. And then you have an IPC stack, a ribbon and carry on combo that actually allows all the services to talk common language to each other. There will be a deeper dive into our IPC stack later on at 4.30 today. Uh, I encourage you to attend that one if you're interested. And then there is this other piece called Hystrix. We'll cover it in a little bit later, but it's really core to our availability strategy, how we ensure that all of the services are protected against downstream failures. Uh, so microservices uh, architecture, again, it's to ensure that key services in the user path are always available. All services are important, but some are more important than others. Decoupling your architecture into microservices allows you to separate the two and also allows you to ensure that um, failure of a non-critical service does not affect your overall service availability. 
Ribbon and Carrion, as I mentioned, these are the client-server IPC pieces. It allows all services communicate to each other using common, common language. And they also use Eureka as the service registry to, to enable them to see one another. And then Hystrix, uh, common, uh, common metaphor for it to use as a circuit breaker, but it's actually much more. So we'll cover it a little bit later. Before we go into that, why? Why would you use Netflix OSS? There is plenty of other stuff out there. So why this? Well, the simple answer is that these are solutions that for common needs, not just for Netflix needs. This is the common infrastructure. There is nothing about it that's specific to a video streaming service. And they work. Not just they work, we tested them at hyperscale. We get millions, billions of requests a day. And all of these services need to be horizontally scalable, extensible, robust. And they've been battle tested and resilient. I mean, if you, you name a corner case, we probably hit it. And if we hit it, we build a test case for it, and we probably fixed it. Not all of them, but a good chunk. And most importantly, it will allow you to focus on your core business rather than reinventing the wheel of the common infrastructure. And so I hope this will be a benefit. These are the, not just some of the companies that are already utilizing and contributing uh, Netflix OSS components. Uh, if your logo is not on it and yet you are using our stuff, I would love to have your logo there. Email it just either to me or to Netflix OSS at Netflix.com. We'll put it up on the site. Uh, one of the more recent additions, actually, Watson, uh, Developer Cloud, Watson as a service, uh, in order to make it available as a service and to make it highly resilient, they actually leveraged power of a lot of the Netflix OSS components. So that's the most recent addition. First principles. Why we built what we built and how we built it. So these are really important. First, let's test our assumptions. If you want to be successful and, you know, this a lot of customers globally available, resilient, you need to assume that everything is broken. If you operate at the scale that success requires and you operate at the speed that success requires, you need to outpace your competitors, you're gonna be pushing changes nonstop. That means things will break. As you operate in scale, even the simplest, smallest things will accumulate, that means the things will break. So you have to accept and embrace that everything is fundamentally broken. And yet you need to engineer, architect, and implement the services that are fundamentally robust on top of a platform that's essentially not. So that's first and foremost assumption. The second one, let's define what high availability means in terms of your lifestyle. If things are always broken, or they break all the time, what do you want to do? Do you want to answer your pager? Do you want to be woken up at night? Or do you want to be, well, perhaps not even at a nice beach, but at least enjoy your days, afternoons, and weekends, and let automation handle things? Let the robust systems heal themselves. Personally, I would prefer the first one. I mentioned before that we architected our system using microservices assumption. What does it mean? It means rather than trying to create a monolithic application that embodies all of your business logic, you make a combination of very simple services that do one thing, but do it really well. Why do, why do we do it? If you imagine a monolith where, let's say, if you're in Java world, everybody contributes a jar file to this Mongo war, and then you push it through a release train, what happens if one of those changes introduces failure that you don't catch using your testing? Well, the whole release train is off. You now need to have all hands on deck to figure out which change broke the release. You have to roll it back. That could be an interesting exercise. Uh, and then even the changes that are absolutely critical to your business must wait for something else to get fixed. Difficult deployments, no clear ownership, not exactly the best scenario. What microservices offer you is a very small, very clear scope. You have a service that does one thing. Right? You have a dedicated team that owns it from beginning to end. You have much greater resiliency. If your particular service fails, unless it's an absolutely critical pass, the rest of the ecosystem does not have to fail. You have much faster deployments, and simple, and rollbacks. Again, you don't have to coordinate with the rest of your company if you have to change something in production. And once again, ownership is the key. If you have a dedicated team responsible for a particular component or set of components, you're going to get much better outcome than nobody owns anything. Another fundamental assumption or principle, state only belongs in a persistent layer. You want as much out of your system as possible to be stateless. What does it give you? Load balancing and failover are now straightforward. 
If you make a request and it fails or it's latent, all you have to do is retry to a different instance, different zone, different region, but you don't need to worry about whether the second call you make will alter or change state or even have state of downstream dependency. You can now autoscale. You have more load, you add more instances. You have less load, you add less instances. Biggest benefit, of course, is resiliency, but it also gives you greater efficiency because now you no longer have to provision for absolute peak in your capacity. Deployments are super easy. You don't have state. I'll cover it a little bit later in the talk, but Netflix, we practice what we call a red-black deployment. That means you have your old cluster running production load. You bring up a new cluster. You do a canary. If everything goes well, you shift traffic. If you ever need to roll back, it's instantaneous because your old farm is still running. Now, state, you still need state. If you have a, any decent application worth mentioning, it probably stores some kind of information but it only belongs in a stateful layer. That means your database and perhaps your caches if you're utilizing caches for uh, lower latency access. But that's the only place it belongs. When you're dealing with state, it involves different operational practices. You cannot do red-black deployments. You have to do rolling pushes. You have to ensure that the state is preserved. Uh, you have certain um, practices that you have to ensure in order to achieve data durability. I'm sure nobody wants to lose customer data. So again, if you minimize that area where state belongs, your life overall will be much, much easier. Isolation and redundancy, that's super important. As your services grow, as they become more globally um, deployed, you have to assume, again, everything breaks. And so your services should be architected and designed in such a way that loss of an availability zone, or even a full region, should not result to loss of quality of service to your user. And I'll, I'll talk about it in, in a little bit. But essentially, a zone goes out, you scale up the others, you continue. A region goes out, it's far more unlikely, but still may happen. You still should be able to continue. And since failure is always there, you have to embrace it. There was an excellent talk a little bit earlier on our um, semi and army and fit testing, and we, we truly embrace it. I would rather have a failure at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when all developers are in the office and well caffeinated and able to attend uh, to the problem rather than 3 o'clock at night on Saturday where just may not be. And this is the key with microservices. As your number of services grow, it's important to have the right operational tools and practices. You don't want each team to reinvent the way of how they're gonna deploy and maintain their services. This needs to be common, this needs to be consistent. So you can expect a consistent behavior from various services that you run in your ecosystem. For us, this is a screenshot of Asgard that we use for all of our uh, services to do uh, red black deployment and other management. Uh, for you, that may be something else. The key is to have the right operational tool that is correct for your system. Now let's actually go inside core infrastructure everything that's really fundamental and common to the rest uh, of Netflix ecosystem. In this simple architecture, you have very few components. You have your front-end app, you have some kind of uh, authentication service as a middle-tier service, you have Eureka uh, Discovery, and that's pretty much it. That, that's easy. Uh, this is a screenshot of a real cold flow pass for just one request into Netflix ecosystem. How do you find all these services? If you're service A, you need to call service B, how do you know where it is? How do you know if it's alive, if it's healthy? For that exact purpose, we build the Eureka, which is effectively a discovery service. What it allows you to do, it allows you to map all your microservices by name to all the other attributes, whether AMI instances, zones, clusters, IP addresses, URLs, ports. In addition, it also stores other useful metadata about the service health. Is it up? Is it starting? Is it healthy, unhealthy? Because if you know this stuff, you're not even gonna try to send your request to unhealthy or services that are still starting up. So Eureka is really at the core of it. Uh, it's as resilient as it, it can get because if Eureka fails, everything else is uh, not well. And so actually Eureka service is replicated in each zone. It's replicated per zone. And uh, in terms of architecting it, we opted for eventual consistency. That means the service is available and it's also partition, uh, tolerant to partitioning. If there is a networking partitioning event between the zones, or if a zone goes down, Eureka services availability is not affected. It consistency maybe, but it's still available. As an additional pre precaution and layer of defense, a Eureka client 
has its own layer of cache that will protect the applications and uh, enable them to continuously run even if the service goes down. So these are all kind of the, 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 the battle scars that we, that we learned and applied. So that's the core. Now you're able to find one another. How do you talk to one another? Common language between clients and services is the key. As you create new services, you don't want to create a new way for them to communicate. It all needs to be common. And so for, for us, we use the combo of Ribbon and Carrion. Ribbon is a client library for internal request routing, and then Carrion is the counterpart server piece that enables your developers to by bypass all the boilerplate code that you typically would need to create, and it also creates consistency of how the services operate. Ribbon library in particular, so first of all, it talks to Eureka through Eureka client, and then it has the downstream load balancer to enable you to load balance uh, your, your traffic to your dependencies. What we realized at Netflix is that different applications may have different load balancing needs, and so the architecturally this built with the ability to plug in your own um, load balancers. So in this particular example, one application is using a customer hash, custom load balancer, and the other one is using our default one that we use internally that's called zone of our round robin. And each application can decide for itself what it wants to do. Zone of our uh, round robin load balancer is an interesting one because if let's say I'm a ribbon client here and I have downstream service that I'm calling that's um, represented in three zones, Service uh, instances and services in one of the zones may become unhealthy or less available or throttled. Maybe services are going through a garbage collection pause. So what zone of our load balancer enables, uh, automatically does actually, it shapes the traffic around the unhealthy services and instances and allows basically retries without your application even knowing what's going. One thing I wanted to highlight for the people who are already familiar with the Netflix IPC stack that what, what you thought of Ribbon and Carrion, what we now call IPC Stack 1.0. And let me explain the differences between this and actually what we have now. So the Ribbon and so Carrion 1.0 um, relied on Apache HTTP client on the client side and Apache Tomcat on the server side. EVCache, which is the caching layer, and Hystrix, which is the, the circuit breaker library, were separate from the client, and so as an application developer, you would have to figure out when and how to integrate them in. And also, the only protocol they would talk in would be HTTP. And fundamentally, that was a blocking architecture. You make a call, you wait for a response. Now, if you're really making your services scalable and you want to achieve high throughput, that may not be good enough. And so what we have now is what we call Netflix IPC stack 2.0. So a couple of key differences. One. Hystrix library and EVCache are now intrinsic part of the client. You don't need to put any more code to integrate them in. You just annotate to enable them. So that's one key. Second one, they're now RxNetty based. And because of that, in addition to HTTP, you can now use other protocols, UDP, TCP, WebSockets. And it's fundamentally now a completely reactive architecture. And so now you are able to um, achieve much more, much more higher concurrency in your request path. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell too much on the code samples, but I wanted to show, illustrate how easy it is to create your applications using Ribbon and Carrion because so much of the boilerplate has been just hidden from you. So this is a sample of creating a Carrion server. It's really not a whole lot of code, and here are the key pieces that you need to fill in. Which ports do you need to listen to? What other dependencies you may have? and then URI that you registered for. That's it. Now you have service up and running. Conversely, on the client side and the ribbon side, we actually give you two different alternatives. One, you can uh, create a client basically using annotations. So you basically create which URI you want to uh, um, make a request to. You can optionally um, annotate Hystrix for the um, uh, circuit breakers. You can plug in EVCache if you choose to. And there you, there you have it, you just issued an asynchronous request. The asynchronous part is towards the bottom when you make it observable. If you don't like annotations or you want to make a synchronous request, you still can. So for example, this, this example shows you how to create a client using a template, using a builder pattern. And then at the end, you actually do a execute, which is blocking, which is your standard canonical model. You make a request, you wait for a reply. 
Availability. So before we talked about high availability and what it means, I briefly touched on the right tooling, and this is really important, so I'd like to reiterate it. You want to make sure that your deployments are automated from beginning to end as much as possible, where after you make the code changes, you choose where to deploy, whether it's your dev, test, stage, or production environment. You run a canary analysis. Again, you really want to automate that. If canary goes well, you want to scale up new instances, shift traffic to them, turn off traffic to the old ones, and then you still need to analyze some more. Some issues are latent. They will not show up right away. And so you wanna keep that old ASG still running. If anything goes wrong, you already have it running. All you do is shift traffic back. You don't need to scramble, figure out what was that AMI, what was the configuration, how was I running it, it's there. Eventually, when you're really confident, then you um, scrape it. Monkeys, we really love our monkeys. Uh, the most famous one, uh, Chaos Monkey, uh, it, it shoots instances, which could be pretty harmless, or at least it should be, but it's a great way to verify that you do not inadvertently introduce state to your system where it shouldn't belong. Your ASG should fundamentally be resilient to Chaos Monkey kills. So what one instance went down, it replenishes it, you're back to the races. Should be a non-event, right? We have bigger ones. We shut down zones uh, using Chaos Gorilla, and we actually shut down regions using Chaos Con. And yes, we do it in production. But again, assumption is everything will break. We better know it, we better experience it, verify that we're resilient to it. If we're not, better fix it. And so Chaos Con, because it's probably the most interesting one, let me go a little bit deeper of how it works. So this is how we run our uh, traffic in North America. Our traffic is geolocated to multiple um, AWS regions. And once in a while, approximately on a monthly basis, um, we let the Chaos Kong stamp on it, okay? And we reroute all the traffic to the surviving region. The key is to figure out, will we be able to route traffic fast enough? Will we be able to scale our systems fast enough? And again, the, to make sure that the isolation principle holds, that there is no hidden dependencies in the systems deployed in multiple regions. After 24 hours or so of running it, we restore the services back. That's actually a little bit trickier because you have to make sure that systems are fully up to date before you start routing traffic back to them. So again, it allows us to validate uh, all of the operational practices that we put in place. Our goal, and that has been the case many times, for Netflix users to experience zero degradation to the quality of service. When that doesn't happen, it does allow us ability to learn what went wrong, learn from it, fix it, make our systems that much more resilient, and also verify that when things go wrong, and there's no such thing as 100% availability, that our teams are ready and they know what to do. So this is, a, this is not an election map. I'm not trying to predict the next election. <laughs> this, uh, this map shows actually visual, internal visualization of how we see traffic from which state and provinces get, get routed to east or west. And this is what happens when we run con. All of the traffic goes to east in this particular case. We run them in both ways. We want to verify that it's not just one way thing. Is all of the stuff that is described to you sufficient? Actually, it's not. You may have all your microservices, you may run the monkeys, you, you may do all this stuff, and it still may not be good enough. And this is where Hystrix comes in. Um, it's best illustrated in the example of our API, which is our very front door. All of the traffic from our users comes through it. And then it fans out and uh, makes downstream calls to the farther dependencies. Now let's actually take a look at the case where one of these dependencies, just one, dies. It's not inconceivable, things, things break. Well, if we don't have an additional logic to protect against us, that will take down API. And that will, in turn, take down all of our users. That's just not acceptable. This scenario, we're not, not gonna live with. So, this is where Hystrix comes in. Hystrix is a library that pretty much every application at Netflix utilizes to provide the following. It allows you, per each of your downstream requests, isolate the failure of that downstream request from your own availability. And it allows you to have control of what you want to do when things fail, not if, when. Do you want to retry? In which case, what should be your retry policy for that particular down downstream dependency? Do you want to just go into degraded fallback mode? In which case, what should that fallback mode be? 
or do you want to just propagate the error up? And it allows you, effectively it allows bulk heading and circuit breaker ability for each of your services. Let's see how it would work in this particular case. Again, we have our happy case, everything works, suddenly one of our dependencies breaks. In this particular case, API may choose to just go to fallback and still continue running. And that's, that's exactly what we want to do. Security. So security has been on a lot of minds lately. I don't know if you heard or read of cases like Code Spaces, Target, Home Depot, you name it. And as our digital footprint grows, security is only gonna grow in our minds because it's only gonna be a bigger target. So at Netflix, our approach to security is the following, trust but verify. Again, we, we like our monkeys. All of the developers at Netflix have full production access and we treat everybody like a mature, responsible adult. At the same time, inadvertently, people may set up incorrect security groups, incorrect uh, f um, certificates, uh, incorrect IAM entities. And so, actually, that's, this is where being in the cloud really helps, because everything is a software, everything is an API. And so Security Monkey takes advantage of um, uh, APIs to actually run scan verification analysis uh, of things like certificates. Do you have certificates that are valid, that are not expiring in the next half an hour? Uh, firewall, are your, all your ELBs that uh, should be accessible, accessible, and vice versa? Uh, are you using correct IAM entities and session keys? Um, are you reaching limits, perhaps? Uh, and so on and so forth. It's effectively a rule engine that you can plug in your own rules and figure out how secure or um, not secure things are. Well, that's, that's internal. Uh, infrastructure and uh, internal crowd. What about people outside of your companies? Reality is that people do bad things on the internet. More often than not. It is difficult to track. It's even more difficult to act on it. Because of that, we actually created an open source two tools called uh, Scumbler and Sketchy. And what they do is Scumbler is a rule engine again to search various sites on the internet where you're more likely to find uh, the abuse and show you the results. And it's also a workflow engine as well because once you found, found something, that's just the first step, then you gotta do something about it. It is flexible and extensible so you can say, you know, for this particular type of abuse, let's say go to, I don't know, Pastebin and then look for these patterns. Or you may go to Twitter and look for that pattern, et cetera, et cetera. Once you found it, you don't want to just go open up your browser on a particular site and start looking around because you may inadvertently bring a problem in. That's what Sketchy is for. It's an API for taking screenshot, screenshots and scraping text in a safe sandbox environment. Once you have that, then you can actually do something about it. And you can actually integrate the two so they work together. So the strategy is use Scumbler to find things, you know, whether it's credential dumps, vulnerabilities, uh, social media chatter about some abuse patterns, or pretty much anything else that you may be looking for. Once you found it, you can use Sketchy, inside Scumbler even, as a safer way to get the information about the abuse so then your teams can act upon it. Now you must be thinking, well, this is great. How do I get started? Well, if you go to our site, we do have a lot of tutorials and sample apps. Um, RSS Reader, which is effectively a very simple application, a blueprint shows you how to make a simple microservices talking to each other using Eureka, Ribbon, Carrion, all the stuff that I just talked about. There's an Acme Air application that was put together by folks at IBM. Uh, and there's a zero to cloud workshop that um, was put together for folks who have not tried anything to do on uh, AWS yet and it really guides you through the very fundamental first steps of setting up your account and get, getting off running. But over the last two and a half years, very clear and strong feedback that we got on our open source that people valued it, but it was really hard to package and deploy it. And this is actually of last year, that was an indicator of how hard it was because one of our cloud prize winners was Peter Sankowskas from Answers for AWS where he created prepackaged Netflix OSS AMIs and uh, um, a cloud formation recipes to create uh, Netflix uh, OSS services. But that still was too difficult. 
And so what I'm here to announce today actually that we're lowering significantly the bar to use. Today we have a technology named Docker. And if you go to this GitHub site under Netflix Skunkworks, zero to Docker, you can get all the source code of how it's all packaged. And you can actually get trusted automated builds from a Docker Hub site under Netflix OSS. These are the services that are already available. There is actually a couple more coming, if not already, than within the next day. Things like Security Monkey, things like Sketchy and Scumbler. And all of these builds are trusted and automated. What I mean is, if somebody publishes a Docker package and says, yeah, go ahead and run it, it's very akin to clicking on a link in the email. You don't know where it came from. These images are built directly from the source that's on our GitHub site, which is the very same code that we're using. And so you have a little bit more confidence that you will not get anything malicious from it. Before, before we go further, I'd like to do a disclaimer. These are not meant for production. First of all, that's now not how we run them internally. Internally, we bake immutable AMIs. It makes sense for us because this way we can run five instances or 5,000 instances of the same code. And also, the way they're packaged, they're not packaged for high availability. I mentioned Eureka service before. It's striped across zones. There is a whole bunch of resiliency baked in. If you just use Docker container for Eureka, it's a single instance. That's not what I would call highly available service. So use these to get, get to running with Netflix or open source, Netflix OSS. Use it to try it. It really flips the equation because before you would have to spend a couple of weeks to understand the services and integrate them into your ecosystem before you actually get the first run out of it. That flips it. You get to run it right away, figure out if it brings you value, then you can decide how and if you should integrate it into your ecosystem. Demo time. Enough of this slide stuff. Well, one more slide. Before. Before I get to demo, this is what I'm going to show you. So on my Mac, I'm going to run a virtual box, which is going to run Ubuntu um, VM. And so all of this will be within single kernel, just running multiple containers. And things I'm going to show you is an exhibitor uh, that actually we use to manage our Zookeeper clusters. So it will run Zookeeper on my laptop. I'll have a Eureka instance taking service registry. I'll have a couple of applications running. One will be uh, Hello OSS, which is effectively a ribbon carry on sample. Again, client server stuff, basic. I'll run a Zool proxy, which is our very front edge layer. It's a very scalable, resilient proxy that allows you to load runtime filters. Uh, and I'll also show you how to run Asgard on your laptop, which was pretty difficult to do before. So let me switch out from this. All right, so just to show you that this is a live demo, Asgard is the only thing that I'm running right now. Sorry, I'm trying to find my mouse here. That's it. Because it's a process, it's super fast to start. You don't need to launch the whole VM. Now Exhibitor is running. If you were to run this from the first time, the only difference would be is network time. Because Docker would, would look locally. If it cannot find it, it will download it. And then the very same effect happens. So let me find my browser here. So Exhibitor is running on the following address. And there you have it. Exhibitor is running. And if I can find my mouse again, you can see that it's actually serving you a Zookeeper cluster of one. And you can do all the things that you can do with Zookeeper. So let's try some other things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to launch both Eureka and Hello OSS service. OK. So now, 
So my Eureka runs on address dot four, and then hello OSS runs on dot five. So let's take a look at what Eureka says right now. So Eureka takes about 30 seconds to show the first screen. Let's give it a little bit of time. Wow, it worked, what do you know? Okay, so what you can see now is Eureka runs, and there's actually clients, uh, hello OSS already registered with it. I was hoping that the first time you would see empty screen, but it already registered. And so you can see that you have one, one AMI running in one availability zone and the service is up. So let me bring up that service. Okay, basic hello world as you would expect. Now because it runs on top of ribbon and carry on, you already have all the benefits of it. And so for example, what I can do is I can go to port 8077 and see the full administration console for it. I can see the environment, jars, JMX, uh, RKS configuration. RKS is a library we use internally for our dynamic configuration. You can change things at runtime on an instance, uh, cluster, zone, or even global level, um, and things like that. But now, let's say I do stop hello world. What will it do? Well, there is a 30 second cache lag delay, so if I refresh it right now, it's still gonna show up. So let's give it a little bit of time, and then what you'll see is that st its state in Eureka will be updated. And that will tell anybody who wants to call this service, you know what, that instance is not good, go call somewhere else. Or maybe don't even, if that's the only one, go to degraded mode, go to fallback. Let's see if that take and hold. Bam, it's no longer up, it's now starting. And so all of this is already running in less than 10 minutes. Let me just show you one more thing. So this is an Asgard that I started earlier purely because it takes a little bit longer to start. And now this is a little bit different. All the previous examples I showed were running purely on my laptop. Now, this instance of Asgard is running on my laptop but it's actually a controlling a test environment out in the cloud. And so I can go and try to do red-black pushes. I can try to go and basically control my environment directly from my laptop, which does give you immediate access to all the Netflix OSS goodness and power that before you would have to spend sometimes days, sometimes week trying to configure and get to running. All right, so that's it for the demo part. Let me switch back to the slides because there's a little bit more material I'd like to cover. So that was the demo. And this is great if you're a Java shop like us. What if you're not? And this slide is not to start the religious language war. All of these are fine languages. We use Java for various uh, historical reasons and because it works for us. Java, Scala, JVM. But if you're not, what do you do? You don't want to re-implement the very same logic in a different um, language. And so internally, we have the same challenge because many of our teams utilize the, um, our culture of freedom and responsibility and choose to use the right tool for the job, which may not be a JVM language. As a platform team, we also don't want to port all of our stuff into various languages, which we then would have to maintain. So we created this concept of sidecars. We recently open sourced Prana, which is our general purpose sidecar, and it's effectively a co-process that runs on your application, uh, on your instance, your, your C Sharp, C++, or Go process talks to it via HTTP REST, and then that integrates it with the rest of the Netflix OSS ecosystem. We have specialized sidecars as well. One we uh, um, open source just on Monday, which is an Elasticsearch sidecar. And we also have Priam, which is our Cassandra sidecar. Those are specialized because they're dealing with very specific stateful systems, and so they have a little bit of twist to them. We do have a thriving Netflix OSS meetup community, uh, over 1,500 and growing. If you're in a Bay Area, I would highly encourage you to sign up. We have meetups 
maybe once a quarter. And those are typically fun, uh, packed houses where we present some of the stuff that we did. But most recently, we have external speakers and just a general, generally a good forum to exchange information. You can follow us on Twitter at NetflixOSS. Uh, or if you want to email us our logo, it's at NetflixOSS at Netflix.com. If you like this talk, we do have a couple more uh, Netflix talks uh, after this. Uh, right after this, there's actually a three-way choice. Uh, there is one on maintaining a resilient front door about our edge services, which will cover much deeper uh, things like Hystrix, like Zool, and a few others. Uh, another choice is effective IPC communication, uh, the pros and cons of microservices that will go much, much deeper than I could cover in this time in Ribbon and Carrion and our overall microservices architecture. And then there's a general cloud migration story, how we had to change the, our culture to DevOps and things like that. And then Friday, we have a talk on using uh, Apache Mesos for scheduling in the cloud. On behalf of everybody who contributed to open source at Netflix, I wanted to thank you. Feel free to visit our site and uh, use and contribute to our components. Uh, and uh, I definitely would welcome your feedback on the session. I think we have a few minutes, so I'll be glad to take any questions you have. Uh, great question. So the question was, can I talk publicly about type of things that we found in Scumbler? So the, the most typical things that we found in Scumbler were cr uh, credential dumps or other type of abuse. Um, there were others a little bit more sinister. Uh, unfortunately, I just don't have enough detail, and I don't want to give you a partial information. Um, if, you, if you have a question that merits a longer, a longer answer, I'll be at a Netflix booth right after this, and I'll be happy to have a chat with you. Um, so the so question was what we use to communicate within region, be, uh, in between regions. So in order to preserve the isolation between regions, we don't want anything on a user call path to be cross-regional. So all of the cross-regional traffic is asynchronous replication, which is mostly Cassandra, but also EVCache, which is our caching layer. We recently open sourced, last week we open sourced Dynamite, which is an asynchronous replication rail, uh, layer for Redis as well. But it's all completely asynchronous on the background. Right. Um, let, uh, let me get the details for you. I don't want to mislead you here. Yeah. Uh, great question. So the question was, how does Eureka know about which state in the life, life cycle the service is? So the service reports to it. So the, the service basically, the, at the simplest, Eureka has two APIs. One of them is, here I am, register me. And the other one, where's the rest of the world? But that's a very simplistic view of it. It's actually a little bit more nuanced. Every time the service changes state, it actually updates its state with Eureka. But it's a, it's a, it, it's a push model Eureka does not pull. Uh, so the question was about um, a recent work done on a Spring Cloud to integrate Netflix OSS components. Uh, it's a parallel effort that's really great for the Spring community. But what you have to realize is that not everybody embraced Spring or embraced it to a different degree. And so to each his own, I guess. <laughs> Right, so, so the question was how do we handle in cross-regional um, cross setting the failures of, of a replication? So this is where technologies like Cassandra come in very handy because they're built on the principle of eventual consistency. So even if there is a networking partitioning event, let's say, or huge latency, and the replication traffic fails, technology like Cassandra will basically leave a hint Then, when the connection is restored, it will need to replay it. And we make that an explicit trade-off choice. Rather than achieving strong consistency, we're actually OK with things not being consistent maybe half of a percent of the time, but still keep our systems available. Um, 
Uh, so the question was whether red black pushes are within each availability zone. Uh, that depends on the service. Most of our services are already um, triplicated throughout at least three availability zones. And typically it's an old ASG that already spans all three zones and a new ASG that also spans uh, three zones. And then you just shift traffic. Uh, no, uh, so, the, so the question was whether for each API or a remote call we check Eureka. No, that's where Eureka client comes in. Eureka client communicates with the servers off band asynchronously. And your application uses the cached information inside Eureka client to make its decisions. Cor correct, but it's, it's, it's a delayed signal, it's not immediate. So if a service goes down, Eureka will update it, but only after service misses three heartbeats. And then you can configure how frequent your heartbeats are. Right, so, so the, let me make sure I understand your question. The question was about how, do we, how did we decide to, to package them in a sense, is it separate, do we you know, bundle them together? So just like our architecture microservices, everything is separated. We also created all the Docker packages separately as well. And so if there is a dependency, it's gonna pull it in anyway, but you should not have to get this whole bundle of stuff, right? Only if you want just one component. Now, one thing I do want to reemphasize again, these are purely for evaluation. They're not for production use. Please do not put them as is into production. Yes? Um, could you define that a little bit better? So, so the question was about how those different services authenticate to one another. Um, in reality, they don't. So we do have some control in terms of security groups, but they all run within the same account. And so there is some out, 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 outward perimeter protection, if you will. They don't have to authenticate to one another in that sense. They do, uh, they do um, use on session, uh, session on, on instance keys, and that's what, that's what we use, but not much beyond that. So that one, I don't know as intimately as I'd like to, but there is a person uh, right after this who'll be talking about our um, API layer, Daniel Jacobson and Bench Mouse at 4.30. These are the right people to ask that question. All right, thank you. Uh,